This is Pastor James, and you are watching 306 Giving. This is a look at what the Bible says about financial giving. And we are not doing this because we're trying to raise money. This is a video that's in a series called The Means of Grace, which is another phrase for the ways that God helps us grow as followers of Jesus. And this specific act of, of worship, giving, is one that you do on your own. It's an individual act. It's very private. Although you need a group in order to do it, you have to have a church to give to. It is something you do on your own. So let's dive into what the Bible says about giving. And the first question is, what is giving? There are a couple terms that I want us to straighten out. First one is uh, tithes. Tithes are the 10% that God asked for. And I get questions all the time about what is that? Is it a tithe on what I make? Is it a tithe on what I own? Is it a tithe on uh, the net of what I make or own or the gross of what I make or own? And um, to be honest, I don't know. The I think the best answer is you should do what God tells you to. And for for me, we just do 10% of our paycheck. And there's a lot of big questions about health insurance and other things. And, and we pray about those things and we just ask God for help. Uh, I don't pay tithe on my money that... Um, is allocated for my retirement that doesn't come in through my paycheck. I could, but I don't. And the reason for that is when I retire, I want to continue. I want to be able to continue tithing. So I'm going to pay my tithe on the money that comes out of my retirement account, not the money that I'm putting in. So it's okay to ask God questions and to use some logic or reason. Hopefully the goal of uh, the question is you trying to figure out how best to honor God, not how can I get out of paying the most amount of money to God. So ties is the 10% that God asked for. And I would say, generally speaking, it's when you get your paycheck, 10% of it goes to the Lord. Offerings are what goes beyond your 10%. Uh, and usually offerings are connected to something like uh, God stirs your heart for missions and so you make a special donation or stirs your heart for a guest speaker that comes to church or God stirs your heart to give towards the building fund. Sometimes it's not connected to something. Sometimes it's just God is telling me that I need to give extra money to the church. So here it is. And uh, those are tithes and offerings. Tithes are really us being obedient and offering is where our generosity starts. You don't get credit for being generous by tithing. That's just doing what God's asked you to do. Your generosity really starts to kick in by um, how generous you are with the rest of your money and how you spend that. And if you're being obedient then to God, which again, all goes back to obedience anyways. So why why is tithing and giving and uh, offerings, why are they the means of grace? So uh, tithing is affirmed before the law, in the law, and by Jesus. Another thing that I hear uh, quite often is, well, tithing is the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament, so we don't do that anymore. We're not obligated to follow the law, so I don't tithe. And that's just couldn't be farther from biblical truth. Let me show you this. Genesis 14.20 Praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies in your hands. Then Abram gave him, this is priest Z, you can look up the whole story later if you want. He gave him a tenth of everything. The law hasn't even come out yet. That's Moses. The Moses and the law and all of that hasn't even started yet. And we see here Abram, who later gets his name changed to Abraham, is practicing the act of worship of giving financially to God a tithe here in Genesis 14. And it also happens another time later before the law comes out. So we see evidence of heroes of our faith 
practicing tithing before before the law. And this leads me to think that God has been stirring people's hearts before we see in Scripture where he writes down, and this is what I want you to do. We are participating in something a lot bigger than just the law. Now, if we flip into the actual law, here it is, tithe from everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit of the trees belongs to the Lord, it's holy. This is one of those laws that uh, it shows up in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You know it's a big deal when it shows up in all three of the law books. And if we fast forward to Jesus' day, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, Woe to you guys, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dillard, and cumin. So think about this. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they were so they were so uh, diligent and, and um, just... Um, restrictive on them trying to do it right. They were so disciplined on tithing that they they didn't just tithe like on their corn or the stuff that they got. It was all the way down to the tiny little spices where they're dividing those up and making sure to bring in, you know, here's a here's a teaspoon of cumin because I pulled out, you know, 10 teaspoons out of my garden. And Jesus says You've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, which is justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former, the tithing part. So Jesus is saying, uh, he's affirming the big picture here, that it's about grace, justice, mercy, faithfulness. And he's also saying tithing is still an important thing. Okay. So we get from this that Jesus is saying tithing is an important thing. Keep doing it. It goes, it's in the law and it goes before the law. So uh, we also see the church demonstrating tithes and offerings. They would tithe to the synagogue where they went and then they would bring offerings that they would gather in their homes that they would give to Paul when he would come by to distribute to other churches that were in need. Those churches, like you see the the incredible generosity of these churches where they were they were selling property and bringing it in. They were they were making huge financial sacrifices in order that no one lives in in need, that no one is is financially oppressed. And I, I think sometimes we look at that and say, oh, the early church didn't tithe, which is not true. Uh, they just gave offerings, so that's just what I'll do. And we use that as an excuse for me just putting 20 bucks in the offering plate you know, two or three times a year and calling it good, when that's not what the early church did. They made huge sacrifices so that uh, they could meet needs around the world. That is, that is our example for us to follow. And it's more than an example. It's a command that God... God calls us to do this. There's a reason why. In fact, Paul, even in his letter to the, the church in Corinth, he fights for them. You guys should be paying your pastors. Have they not earned the right? You know, you can't muzzle an ox. He quotes that and says, don't you think that you think God cares about oxen? This is not about oxen. It's about people working for the Lord and they should have a right to share in the harvest. And he doesn't want uh, a salary, but he is fighting for those that are in the church back then that are pastoring, that are being apostles, prophets, preachers, and teachers. And he says, those people, they they should be paid. How do you do that? You do it by tithes and offerings. And let's let's full circle, come back to the big picture, what Jesus was talking about. There's another verse where Jesus is is talking to the people and he says, "Listen, you, this money is such a big deal, and you can't serve both God and money, or the word mammon, which is like a spirit of money, or we might say the word greed, which may come from our flesh, or it may be the devil tempting us to be greedy." And God says, Jesus says, "You're gonna, you're gonna serve one or the other. You, you can't do both." 
And one of the things that happens when we are generous, when we obey the command to tithe, and we give uh, offerings to the Lord, when we listen for his voice to be generous with others and give to the church and to support the people that are serving and working in the church, when we do that, it releases a stranglehold around the, the neck of our heart where where money can just keep us from realizing a breakthrough that God has for us. And this is really why I get passionate about talking about money. It has nothing to do with, you know, the building or where our finances are at or or money to be raised or salaries or anything like that. I don't I don't care about anything of that. What I care about is the freedom that you can find in Christ if you'll submit to his word, which talks about the stranglehold that money can have over your life. And I, I see it in so many Christians. They're, they're willing to believe in God, but they're not willing to bow the knee to God, especially when it comes to their wallet. And we see that in the, the North American church, how very few people, according to, to research, ever give anything to the church. And we look at how much money that, that people spend on uh, things that we don't need. And then we look at the problems that are in the world. And I just think, what could happen if, the, if people really gave to God? How we could, we could fix the water crisis and we could end world hunger and we could end the slave trade and we could, we could support our pastors and we could, we could equip them to be leaders and to not... Uh, live under the conditions that most pastors live in. And it, it's been rated as psych- psychologically one of the hardest, most dangerous jobs in the U.S. Not because you're going to like, you know, your life is in danger, because you're overworked, underpaid, and a huge amount of expectation is put on you to perform. And what a breakthrough we could see if our churches could could ease up even just one of those areas and fund our pastors so they're not living at the poverty line. Okay, how to give. This is uh, a way that our church helps you in giving, and we just want to break down any barrier for you to give. You can do it in our services. We have envelopes where you can stick it in. You can not put your name, or if you do put your name, we'll record that in and put it on your giving profile so that you can get tax statement, which I'll talk about in a second. You can give online at camnas.org. You can even text a dollar amount that you want to give to 84321. And it's literally that easy. You have to set up your profile one time. It'll walk you through your account with us and you add your payment source, like your bank account or a credit card or a debit card. And then the next time, you don't have to do any of that. You just text you know, 100 to 84321, and you get a text back that says, thanks, if you want a refund, type refund, and we'll send it right back to you. It's literally that easy. And you can give to all the different funds through that too. You just text the amount and then the, the, the fund word, you know, like event or guest. All right, you can also give through our app on the iOS App Store. And we also have a bunch of designated funds so that you can allocate money to go towards missions or the event speaker or for youth or for the building fund. Whatever God is stirring your heart, we have a fund for it that you can give directly to. And if we don't, we'll set one up. And then last, uh, we will manage your gift wisely, not just in how we spend spend that and use that and invest that, but we'll keep an accurate record of that. You can access that anytime on your giving profile and you can download it anytime. And at the end of the year, we'll send you either an email or a letter, your choice of your annual giving amount. And we're happy to to do that and to help you walk through that to make sure that it's accurate. And if it's not, we will investigate it to make sure that it is um, 100% accurate. So those are the ways that our church can help you give. And again, we just want it to be an act of worship to you. And I just want to say too that 
we do uh, a great job of tracking the data, but we also are not tracking you, right? We're not looking up, well, who who hasn't tied or um, what did this person give so that we can uh, accommodate them the most. Nobody gets special treatment based off of what they give. Honestly, uh, I don't even know. I never, I'll look at that every year for... Um, uh, to see who qualifies for board nominations because that's one of uh, our policies. You have to be a tithing member to be even on the ballot or considered for the ballot. But I'm, I just look at who's qualified. I'm not looking at who isn't giving or what they're giving. Um, I don't need to know it. I don't want to know it. Uh, when I do know it, it does not influence me at all. I'm not one of those pastors that um, is is afraid of, of, you know, treating people differently or whatever. Cause I, I just know that, uh, it doesn't matter, right. That I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And so our team does the same thing. We just ignore it. And we try to make that as private for you as possible. And I just believe that if you, uh, surrender to this area of your life, that God will bless you for it, that you will experience that freedom that comes from living in a surrendered life. And I would challenge you to just start doing it. If you're not, I know I know how hard it could be because I know what it would be if I gave what I'm currently giving and then added another 10% off of it. That would be huge. We would have to cut out some big stuff in our budget to make that work. So I know it's huge, but I would encourage you to do it, to just make it habit and test God and see if he won't provide for you. And if you can't do that, start with like 5% or start with 2% and then every month make it go up 1% or whatever it is. Just ask God, God, how can I want to do this? Help me do it. How can I get from where I am to where you want me to be? And I believe God, I know that God will answer that prayer. This is 305, uh, it's not 305, it's whatever number we're on, giving. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.